Hi, this is Paul Gregg. Uh, about a month or so ago, I was I gave a Learn at Lunch lecture at my university, uh, University of Utah, and I made a bunch of charts and uh, revised them a bunch of times. And uh, it's kind of like, what did you learn in your engineering career? Kind of a presentation. And I'm going to document it uh, in a video, just go through my charts again and informally talk. This is not a professional video. I'm just trying to to uh, document what I said. And uh, so we'll start. Uh, the value of engineering, curiosity, integrity, and arguing. Lessons I learned at a career in Boeing Structures Research and Development. Uh, and then I, I will uh, transition from my technical uh, experience into more management uh, things. And I'm intrigued by this term obliquity and achieving your goals indirectly and how engineering companies start out uh, one way and they finish up another way. And uh, maybe uh, talk about a little bit about my feelings about Boeing's current troubles with... Uh... And so, uh, all these photos, photos that I found, uh, they're in my presentation I found on the internet. I didn't uh, take anything from Boeing to do this. There should be nothing classified in this or proprietary in this uh, presentation. And if it is classified, I, I declassified it myself in my mind by thinking about it. So, um, since I retired in 2014, I have taken up backyard roller coastering, and and uh, people have an interest in that. And then I I kind of talk about that a little bit, but then uh, go into what my career taught me. So um, I designed and built four backyard roller coasters so far. I have a YouTube channel where that's fairly well documented. I wrote two ebooks and uh, I'm selling them online. And uh, it's been a, a great fun ride with my, literally, with my grandkids. And these are a couple of them and a couple of my uh, backyard roller coasters, which I've since moved. So I tore these down and built one at our new house. I also. Uh, worked on uh, with a couple of teachers over the years about uh, STEM courses uh, with physics, math, and engineering, and I'm going to document that as well. Um, just to talk a little bit about the backyard roller coastering, uh, when I say research and development, uh, this is what I mean when I say structures research and development, is that I you, you have this big system of the cart and the track and all these elements of that, and uh, Good engineering is uh, looking at that and saying, what's my weak point? What would break first? And uh, if you look here, I've got a little cursor. If you look at this, it's where the PVC track attaches with uh, three and a half inch screws to the ties. And that is really, I have a welded steel cart. I built that really well and it's designed 34 different carts. And this is a couple of them, uh, different dynamics and different uh, mechanisms and stuff. But um, this joint where the uh, PVC rail crosses the tie and is fastened on there, when the wheels roll across there, that's really my weak point. Weak point. And uh, well, one of them. And so this is just one example of what you do uh, if you want to make something better. Uh, I devised a, a series of what I call element level tests. So this is the real track. Um, with the screws holding uh, the PVC rail onto the tie. And this is a test that simulates that. And uh, it's got the roller coaster wheels and the PVC and the fasteners and stuff. And then I did a bunch of, I, I came up with 30 or 40 different improvements to that that could make this uh, go at a higher load. What happens is the, it's, the weak point is where the, where the screws go into the wood. The wood is peeled apart in a mode one uh, failure and uh, it's like splitting wood. Uh, wood is a great material except when you hit, hit it on the end with an axe and it splits and that's a good thing if you want to split it but it's a bad thing if you want to hold things together and so um, basically how do you overcome that? Uh, this was a, a test rig I came up with to test uh, the PVC rails themselves but this one is the important one 
and uh, I made uh, maybe a hundred different tests of third of maybe ten or twelve different concepts. This is an example of a concept where this steel claw goes over the end of the the tie, and then you fasten the uh, PVC rail through that steel, and so you eliminate this uh, failure mode where the wood splits apart because it's all the, the load comes up the steel and then gets transferred into the wood in a in a more efficient manner. And so this is uh, two or three or four times stronger than this. Of course, it's a lot more expensive and a lot more trouble. And so you kind of match your performance you want with the uh, budget you have. And hopefully you get a sweet spot where you get uh, pretty good performance at a reasonable price. And that's what uh, good development engineering is. But I, like I say, I, I had... Uh, 30 or 40 different concepts. It's kind of expanded the concepts. Uh, uh, this is the way development's done. You you uh, identify your problem, you describe it, and then you come up with lots of different solutions. And then you down-select those solutions uh, based on uh, common sense analysis. And, uh, and then you maybe build and test some of them and see which ones are easier to fabricate and see which ones come out in, in testing. So that's that's an example of a uh, taking a broad look at a structure, see what the weak points are, and then developing a plan where we design, analyze, uh, fabricate, and test uh, element-level specimens, or in this case, element-level specimens. So this is the process that I came up with over the years. Uh, and this is uh, basically you start with your requirements, and then you make a design, and you kind of go back and forth between design and analysis for a little while and try to see what you can do to make it better. And then you go into fabrication. And fabrication, you may be building something that hasn't been built before with new processes. So that's going to help you develop your process as well. And it, and you find in the final round, the final time you go around this, you have to have finalized processes. But, pro, you know, you're developing your design the same time somebody's developing the the processes and the analysis methods and and the certification plans and everything. So this kind of has to be done iteratively. That's the key, is that you go around this circle several or a lot of times uh, to get a better design. So there's the design. You may, you you identify elements, subcomponent, or component level test hardware. And in the case of uh, the backyard roller coaster, I had an element level test, which is the joint between the uh, track the PVC rail and the t and the ties so and you do this for every critical thing in your in your um, design and I've done this at Boeing for uh, new uh, structures and this turns out to be hundreds of, of different element level tests there there's different temperatures there are different there's there's fatigue there's all kinds of just any number of things that you need to look at. And uh, so an element level, uh, uh, that complementing an, an, a good analysis or a calibrated analysis, an analysis calibrated by uh, testing, uh, really gives you confidence that uh, nothing's going to surprise you. So you fabricate these elements, and then you do a non-destructive inspection of them, and you test them. And that... Uh, the analyst looks at that, and the design. Everybody gets in a room and says, "Okay, this is what we tried to do. How did it work out?" And then you uh, feed that back into the analysis, and then they can tweak their analysis to say, "Yeah, we were a little bit off, and uh, we can analyze better now, and we can make a better design." And then you make the better design better, fabricate uh, specimens, element level specimens, uh, non destructively inspect them and test them. And then you're calibrating all of these uh, things at the same time. In the end, when you're done with this, you end up with deliverables such as a process specification certification plan to say this is in aerospace. You know, we have to have a certification plan. How many different tests are we going to do? What level do they have to pass? Uh, what load do they have to hold without breaking? And then we know that this, uh, this element on this component is certified for flight or whatever it has to do over its life. At the same time, the analysis methods are uh, 
checked out. You know, they're uh, they're tweaked and checked out, and we know that we have analysis methods, so we can. And once you do this for one element, you can do you can kind of use that same mentality for a little bit different element of a different size. Maybe the loads change on the NICTA airplane or a different part of the wing or whatever, and you can you're confident that you can use. Uh, those manufacturing processes and those an analysis methods and the design guides. Basically, you you make a book that says this is how you design this part of this wing and this joint or whatever. And that's how uh, the process of re structures research and development works. Um, I went to work at Boeing in 1980. I became an associate technical fellow. Later on, and uh, this is the kind of stuff I worked on. New materials and processes, um, a lot of titanium, and then composite fibers, uh, chop fiber composite, metal matrix composites, a lot of different things. Joining processes, those, those same new materials, uh, adhesive bonding, diffusion bonding, and welding in the case of uh, the metals. And then... Uh, Architectures. Uh, this is very important. You know, it's not just the material properties that make something good. It's in. It's more important to get your architecture right. And when I say architecture, I mean, do you make this a honeycomb sandwich, uh, a truss core, isogrid, corrugation, hat stiffened? It's the architecture that outweighs. Uh, outweighs not the right word. It's more important than uh, than the material properties. And you could have a material that's. Um, less strong than another material and yet because it's amenable uh, or uh, amenable to a certain kind of architecture it ends up being the better choice i worked on a lot of different uh, programs um, in space military and commercial aerospace programs so anything from things in production to things that have low likelihood of being uh, going to production, uh, futuristic space uh, vehicles and stuff like that. And I've had some exposure to impact, vibration, and thermal stresses. So a really nice career in uh, a research and development group that, that, that worked with programs in space, defense, and commercial. Just a ton of fun. Um, aside from what I did... Uh, Technically, in my career, I uh, was really interested in uh, the interchanges I had between engineering and management, uh, the trade between cost and quality, and uh, and uh, reputation and profit as the company, as the Boeing company evolved over the 35 years I worked there. And I'm going to attempt to fairly uh, address some of the stories I have. And uh, I know there's many sides to every story but i'll start with my engineering side and especially when something really went wrong and and try to be fair about the management side of that you know they're under pressure to uh, do it quickly and do it cheaply and this is really from my view and i'll but i'll try to be fair about uh, 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 other people's views so i did work uh, a lot of uh, hot structure early on um, um, the National Aerospace Plane, the uh, precursor to the uh, ALS, uh, the SLS launcher, just uh, in a development, a very preliminary developmental kind of stage, the X-32 fighter, which uh, ultimately became the F-35, uh, the hot structure underneath where the engines were going to point down. Uh, and then I went on to the 737 and the 787, a lot of the hot areas there around the engine, but other things too. That's a, kind of a summary. Um, when you go to work as an engineer, you can do basic research or you can do applied research. You know, you can do basic, I'm just developing this new composite material and I don't know where it's going to be used. Or you can say, I'm, I, I know something about the, this new manufacturing method, this new material, and I'm interfacing with programs to say, hey, what if we built this uh, wing flap uh, using this new material? Would it be cheaper? Would it be lighter? Or is there a trade between that? At Boeing, there's there's central engineering pro, in engineering groups and program groups. So program, if I worked on the 777, I'm on that program. <coughs> A central group is more research and development and, and builds, um, designs, builds, tests, uh, things that are never going to fly, but, but uh, 
you know, it's things that you might do 10 or 20 years from now. I think it's important, Boeing used to move people between, engineers used to spend some time on a program and then they would, for three years on a program, then they would go into back into a research area and, and those things that they were constrained not to do on a, on a program, they could uh, develop a little better and then bring them back to the next program. And that's really kind of died out because we don't have that many aerospace products coming out nowadays and uh, the movement in between is is kind of stagnated and uh, and I think that's uh, that's a bad thing we need to have uh, let people go get new ideas and then develop uh, those ideas into a good product and keep that cycle going another lesson I learned is that uh, you got to talk to everybody and you can't be arrogant because you have a degree from a college in engineering the mo some of the most clever people I know at Boeing didn't go to college and for one reason or another, but boy, you, they, they, they've been living and they really care about their work and uh, lab technicians and shop workers. A lot of times they have really good ideas and, uh, and you gotta, you gotta, you gotta go find out. The most important thing in engineering is curiosity. And if you're the kind of person who says, uh, man, how, how, do, how does that work? what is inside this thing you know i it's really interesting i've never seen this before or why did that break you know this is really interesting and i just you know you think about it all the time you know you wake up in the morning your most productive mental time is when you wake up in the morning and if you've had a um for me if i had a difficult engineering problem the day before then then i wake up thinking about that and i think i well, what about this what about that and i can't wait to get to work to to try something out i love engineering i love modeling real life mechanisms and structures with mathematical models sometimes it's just an equation you know that's what equations are they're models of real of what happens in real life and they can tell you they can help you predict what's going to happen uh, advanced modeling finite element models and testing is really modeling where engineering is all about modeling either uh, in real life you know real life modeling or uh, in a computer or in a, in a mathematical equation and uh, i just think that's really interesting that we can take a look at something and know very with high confidence what's going to happen next uh, testing at a coupon element subcomponent and component levels coupon level testing is where you're just testing the basic material an element usually involves a joint uh, a, a single joint. A subcomponent would be like part of a wing box or something like that. And then a component is a, is a whole wing, I guess. And you know, the definitions of those can change, but I really love uh, that aspect of engineering, the modeling, whether it's inside a computer or real life with a test. So now we're starting up at the beginning of my career, and uh, I learned some things. Uh, we had at the University of Utah where I went, there was an egg drop contest. And I really remember it because uh, you had to catch an egg from seven stories or something and not break it. And that, that was the only rule. And, uh, and so they were dropping these eggs and people would run their, their, their machine that was supposed to catch this egg. And some people went to great extents to uh, catch this egg with, with spring mechanisms and boxes full of uh, all kinds of different materials and uh, it, it was really complicated but the guy who won was a guy probably a farmer's kid and he just took a tub of sawdust out there you know one of those big maybe four foot diameter tubs uh, full of sawdust and unbelievably that egg would drop from seven stories and it, I guess you can predict that it's going to aerodynamically line up and and hit on its end and it's as it turns out an egg is very strong if it hits on its end and then the egg a big flurry of sawdust a poof of sawdust when it hit and then the egg would be sitting on top of the sawdust and so i learned that uh from that that you really sometimes the simplest not often but sometimes a simple cheap solution is the best solution my first program was a low roland air ground to air missile it came out of a nine foot tube nine foot long missile the uh, wings deployed it spins for stability it had a a, a sustain a, a booster motor in the back and it took like a second and a half to bring it up to high speed and uh, and then there was a, sustain, a sustainer motor and so this grain a solid solid grain like a big firework really 
uh, it uh, it burned and it had a shape to it so it burned in a certain pressure pattern and then it had a a, a tube in the back that uh, sent the thrust down to the to the to the back nozzle and uh, it had to last eight seconds and it uh, it had to withstand a certain pressure and a bunch of temperature and it had it ablated away to uh, to deal with the the temper the temperature and so uh, initially this uh, Roland missile had a quartz phenolic blast tube and the rejection weight was uh, they only they were only could make one good one out of 50 tries and so they're extremely expensive and uh, they were costing about ten thousand dollars a piece and so they were really a rare commodity it was hard to, hard to get one for a tester and and they just at some point decided well that's just the way it is we can't make them any better and uh, this is what we're going to do and they had this super expensive uh, quartz phenolic tube and uh, one day a guy talked to one of the materials and process people talked to a supplier and he was uh, he had an, they were went through a bunch of different products and he had a cotton cotton epoxy tube that they used for some I don't even know what they used it for something somewhere and they were $15 a piece for this the size we wanted and you had to do some threading on the end so it would fit in there and stuff like that and nobody took it serious because it was so cheap so two years went by and we were doing some testing we were testing some igniters i think and uh there was a test range north of north of seattle at Tulalip, and they had a big uh tunnel and then they would shoot a missile and it would land in uh, i think a hundred stacks of plywood and just kind of burn and so all we were interested in is the first 50 feet of flight <coughs> and so uh they didn't want to spend they didn't want to they didn't have any blast any quartz blast tubes and so for this test it didn't matter what happened after uh it ignited and flew for 20 feet we didn't care that it blew up afterwards and so this guy brought out this uh, cotton phenolic tube that he'd had in his desk for two years and they said hey let's just stick this in you know it'll, it'll be interesting to see see it blow up or something and uh they put it in and it worked it uh it it worked fine and uh if we'd have only figured that out if someone had tried the simple easy solution um we'd have saved tons of money this is a lesson i learned working on the f-22 get your requirements right in the first place this is uh, over my career i the re one reason i had to work in high temperature titanium um, technologies is because so many times we've had to replace carbon fiber composite you know there's all the rage is carbon fiber composite everybody wanted to see as much of that on their plane as they could and they would fudge the requirements or come up against the requirements or say something silly like well if the temperatures are too high we'll just put a ceramic blanket over it and uh, the ceramic blankets turned out to be not very reliable and uh, and so I spent a lot of my career changing uh, coming up with titanium sandwich structure to replace carbon fiber sandwich structure which uh, which couldn't take the heat, especially in the fuselage area around the engines. And so uh, it's just so important to get your, get your temperatures, get your requirements right in the first place. Um, we, uh, these, uh, the, another example here is these, every, on the F-22, every third, all these spars started out to be carbon fiber composite. And then they did a live fire test where they explode a, a round of ammunition inside the wing with the where the fuel is and uh it's supposed to the wing is supposed to hold its integrity uh and it came apart uh all these carbon fiber uh spars unzipped along their weak weak spot their uh mode one failure of composites and so then their solution was we're just going to machine titanium uh, ribs every third one put titanium ribs in here to solve this live fire problem we have and that's how it went to production and that's how it is today but if they'd have just gotten their requirements right in the first place um, so I was I was involved in uh, in uh, finding a uh, lighter 
cheaper solution than these machine titanium spars. And we came up with a welded sine wave titanium one, which was actually in production on B1B and uh, was uh, a good solution to that. But never got, you know, once they'd started in production, they couldn't stop with what they had. And they just, that's one reason these, ex these airplanes cost so much. Another one, uh, similar story, C-17 blown flap. I was involved actually in trying to replace the ribs on these uh, with uh, welded sine wave uh, spars. There's uh, these big blown flaps come down and make it so the C-17 can take off really in a short airfield. Uh, the thrust actually flows against the, the flap there. And uh, the aerodynamics are such that this thing can almost jump into the air. So these are about 34 feet long, and they're up to 8 feet deep, uh, wide. And there's, I think, 34, 34 ribs in each one of these. And somewhere early in the C-17 program, there was a giant push for carbon fiber composites. And they made these out of carbon fiber. Uh, they had ribs, and they did the whole production run the, of uh, carbon fiber blown flaps for the C-17. And early on, they had this thermal analyst. This is a story that the, the lead designer told me, and so I believe it. Uh, early in the program, they wanted to know what the temperatures were on these uh, flaps, and he did an analysis, probably just a hand analysis, and came up with 550 degrees, and they said, well, that's too, too hot for carbon fiber composites. Can you, can you come down on that? Because we really want to make these out of carbon fiber composites. And that, the analyst was bullied into redoing the analysis and and changing tweaking things such that it only sh it showed that the the temperatures only got to somewhere like 250 degrees okay now we can make them out of carbon fiber composites and that's a it's a little different you know the people who engineered the C17 were really commercial airplane people and there's a difference between military engineers and commercial engineers, and people will argue about this, but in general, the, the, the simple way to state it is in, in a military or space program, there's 10 analysts to one designer. So there's a lot of analytical power that goes into it, and they can afford that because they have a lot of money. And in commercial, uh, it would be reversed. There would be uh, one analyst for 10 designers, and, and so the level of analysis yeah, if there's a problem, you can certainly get a higher level of analysis. But in general, because it's cheaper structure, you know, it's uh, commercial uh, traditionally has been about $100 a pound. Uh, not that anymore, but traditionally you kind of went on that $100 a pound. In military, you'd go $1,000 a pound. And in space, you go, well, I think $10,000 a pound. $1,000 a pound for commercial uh, ten thousand dollars a pound for military and a hundred thousand dollars a pound for things that go into space, and that makes sense, you know, that uh, weight's really critical going into space. And anyway, military and space have a lot more money than commercial. And so, what happened was they uh, built the tooling and built these composite blown flaps, and then it came time for the test flight of the C 17. and you don't take off in the air right away. You run it down the runway a few times and put the flaps down and turn the engines on. And the flaps started smoking. And this is for flight tests. This is you're ready to sell these planes. You're ready to deliver them. And all you have to do is flight test it. And they find out that the none of the flaps are any good. They're all, they're all going to burn up. All because they bullied this thermal stress analyst, analyst early on and nobody caught it after that. And so uh, the whole program was stopped. They had to completely redesign and rebuild these out of titanium, all the all titanium. And so they, and the quick way to build something out of titanium, the ribs that are in these big giant flaps is uh, machine them out of blocks. And so the buy to fly was 22. You buy 22 pounds of titanium, you machine 21 pounds away, and you fly one pound. Uh, incredibly, ridiculously expensive. And they just fastened them onto the titanium skins. But that's, you know, they were in a 
they were trying to get the airplane out the door and they had to come up with a and so the designer I talked to was the guy who had to do that and we were talking about a welded version of that those ribs and did a bunch of testing that that said yeah we could make these far far uh, you know at a tenth of the cost of what they currently are turns out we were too late they'd already sunk the money into uh, they'd already delivered and were flying some planes and they only sell a couple hundred of these at most and and so it just the economics didn't work out to to save the money back but the the lesson is if you're an analyst if you're an engineer don't let anybody bully you into changing your mind about something stick by your analysis stick by your test stick by this information search as you've done and the information you have or make them convince you that you need to change your mind because uh, in the end, time and time again, it's way more expensive to fix a problem than to just do it right in the first place. 787 side of body, another fiasco. Um, when it was the 7E7 in developmental world, the the 78, the new Boeing airplane, which was called the 7E7 in development, um, they had a side of body joint, which involves going from composite to metal, to a metal joint and back to composite in the fuselage from the wing to the composite. This is a complex joint. They had one and they tested it at an element level, a big enough level to, they, to the, where they knew this worked. And uh, 78, the 787 had a problem. They eliminated the chief engineer position. They, uh, the, other, the other manufacturing and supplier management people said, hey, previously on previous programs, the chief engineer had too much power. He could stop the whole program from going. And so they eliminated the chief engineer position, which eliminates one level of review. Uh, the other thing was there, everything was going to computer-aided design. And the engineers with, with uh, 30 years of experience couldn't just go out and look at the drawing. There was something really beneficial to say, OK, we're going to release this drawing. The guy who drew it, the designer, who designed it, the analyst had to sign, the, sign it, his name on a piece of paper, and the manager of all of those groups, they all had, it was about eight people that had to sign this drawing to kick it out. And the, the senior level people with the experience uh, weren't uh, up to speed on, on how to, to really take a look at these things hard. And there was this kind of a, well, that must be right, it looks right, or, or something, I don't know. But uh, the other thing is that the Boeing had acquired McDonnell Douglas and the engineering manager responsibilities changed a lot. Instead of, uh, and you had a manager who was just managing people and computers and desks and parking spaces. And they, they wanted the, the, the uh, McDonnell Douglas management method, uh, which was straight out of GE and Jack Welsh and Harry Stonecipher, uh, they didn't want the Boeing managers to be that responsible. Uh, they just wanted them to manage the people. They didn't want it to manage. So instead of having a guy who'd spent 25 years uh, in a wing design group be the next uh, wing design manager, they would take somebody from aerodynamics and make him the manager over the wing design people. And so there was a, a total one very important level of review that was uh, lost <laughs> with this newer and supposedly better management system that was really tuned toward profit and uh, and meeting schedules than it was the best in engineering. And I'll we'll talk about that. That's a controversial statement. And certainly you have to make money. You have to uh, stay on schedule. But uh, you can't compromise your basic engineering, especially in absurd ways like I'm talking about here. So the to 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 go back to the uh, seven eight seven side of body, and I have this from a really good authority, not only my own experience, but someone who was really right in the middle of it, telling me uh, what the pro what the the management problems were, and the the so um, we had a side of body joint that worked. And they sent it over to commercial. Commercial took a bunch of mainline seven eight seven six seven side of body joint designers, and said, "This is your deal." And they changed it. 
they uh, they changed the layering of the composites to uh, big blocks that that where you dropped many many plies all at one time and and they weren't really familiar with how to design uh, good uh, composite metal joints and somehow there just wasn't enough reviews um, they did not want technical reviews and they kind of said thank you uh, we'll see you later to the to the research and development people and they went and changed the side of body joint and uh, and didn't have enough time to do any element level tests so they did they found this out when they tested the 787 wing the the structure they do whenever you have a new model you have to build a full airplane that's never going to fly and pull on the wings or do a, lots of different tests but pull on the wings until something breaks and they got to about 100 and 15% of limit load. You have to get to 150% of limit load, which is called ultimate load. You have to get to ultimate load. And at about 70% of where they needed to be, they started hearing big bangs in coming from the from the wing. And they unloaded it and then they tried it again and more bangs and things were delaminating. And and this is an incredibly uh, intrusive thing to happen because it means you don't have an airplane. You can't meet your basic requirements. Uh, and so they took a year delay in the program to fix this side of body and go to a joint. They brought in a bunch of composite experts and they said, well, who expected this to work? You know, this is, uh, this is just bad design practice. And, and, uh, and it wasn't reviewed. It didn't have a bunch of engineers come in and crit critically review their design. They figured... The 787 management style was we don't have time for reviews. Reviews, you get two people in a room and they start arguing, and then your your budget and your schedule's gone, and uh, and so they eliminated arguing from their program, and this is what they got. Uh, Eric Hoffer, a philosopher, said disagreement is the beginning of thought, and if you're on an engineering program, you can't have enough critic critics. You want your enemies in the room telling you what they, why they don't think your structure is going to work. And then you say, what can I do to prove to you that this works? And you change something, you do more testing, whatever you have to do. <clears throat> you you convince your, your biggest critic that uh, it's safe and then you know you're good. Technical reviews are good. And arguing doesn't have to be disrespectful. It can be respectful. The, at the old Boeing, people yelled at each other all the time when I first worked at Boeing. And then they went and had a beer together, and they were friends. But they were, they could argue respectful, respectfully. And now it seems like in in the workplace, arguing is, you can't argue. It's bad. It makes people feel bad or something like that. And uh, and I think it's it's a bad direction for everybody. This is another example. I have lots of these examples. These are only a few. Often materials and process decisions for products are made poorly. You know, with the compartmentalization of engineering efforts, um, it's hard when you, we, you know, the, the 737 MAX came along and they said, hey, we've had a few of these uh, main landing gear doors get hit by the tow equipment. And so is there something tougher than, right? I think the design was com carbon fiber composite honeycomb sandwich. This is what these main landing gear doors are. And that kind of have an evolution over its life too. But everybody likes to improve the, anything that's removable on an airplane is where all the new technologists try to get it because it's very difficult to change primary structure. You only get a chance to do that once every 10 years or nowadays once every 20 years. And so there's, it's really difficult to even find anybody who knows how to do that. But it, uh, the removable parts get a lot more uh, development work done on them because they're uh, easier to replace. So engineers have become compartmentalized, and, and it turns out that you know the 737 people, they manned up a bunch of people, uh, 20 people, and they said it's your job to decide what we're going to do about if we're going to change these uh, nose landing gear doors. And... And one guy happened to know somebody in titanium super plastic form development at Boeing, and they came in and did a pitch, and they were manufacturing people. Nobody did any structures engineering. And they said, yeah, you ought to change those to super plastically formed diffusion bonded titanium. 
Uh, and so you're trying to replace, and 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 then they said, well, how much will it weigh? Oh, it'll weigh the same. And they just they just said, how much, how thin do these sheets have to be in titanium to equivalent to have the same weight as the current main landing gear door? And and that's how that's they didn't do a real stress analysis. So for six months, these people worked on this silly idea of replacing main landing doors, gear doors with titanium. And then they, they brought us in, and we kind of had some expertise in the engineering side of super plastic form t- diffusion bond to titanium. And, and we looked at it for a couple of weeks with them and then said, what are you doing? Why aren't you looking at chopped fiber composite? Something, if you want it cheaper, why aren't you looking at any variety of thermoplastic and, and new things that happened in in uh, composites uh and uh, so it was kind of embarrassing because these guys we work with in, in S Titanium, the manufacturing people, saw us as people that come in and spoiled their deal, you know. But it, you have to be honest, you know. And uh, they're really, you know, it's harder and harder to do really effective trade studies where you trade aluminum and composite, uh, continuous composite, chop fiber composite, titanium, where you can trade all of those things fairly in the same room you know it's uh uh we don't have central groups that can can really take a a look at at anything at some point so that's that's a a problem currently i think changing subjects but same lesson um i worked for six or eight years on the high-speed civil transport which was a new version of the uh, supersonic uh airplane for NASA. NASA was spending a lot of money on this and Boeing took their money and did a bunch of research. And one thing I I worked on for a couple of years was supersonic laminar flow control. So what that is, is uh, this titanium glove fits over. This was a, this was a flight experiment before, which would eventually go on to a supersonic transport. (coughs) You have a, you have a metal, um, wing surface, and you drill tiny, tiny holes in it with laser beams, and then you suck the boundary layer off so that the drag is lower over the your wing. And that's, in a nutshell, what laminar flow control is about. And so we did this uh, flight experiment. We, we had a certain date, about 19, early 90s, we got together with NASA and Rockwell and Douglas. There were five entities on this team, and... Uh, and we all met at Boeing, and we said that we're going to make an interface control drawing. In other words, Boeing is going to make the panel that goes on this experimental airplane, if it's F-16 XL2, two pilots with a composite wing on it. It's a one-of-a-kind experimental plane where they put a composite wing um, on an F-16 fuselage. So over the top of the wing, we were going to have this experiment that uh, sucked the boundary layer off and, and they kind of, they had 900 pieces of instrumentation on this thermocouples and pressure taps and all kinds of things to see. And cameras pointed at it to see if, if when you turned the suction on the, uh, the drag went down, basically. It's a, it's a holy grail of aerodynamic experiments. We made the most perfect, uh, aerosurface ever made. We held a 22 foot long, tolerance within plus or minus ten thousandths of an inch on a loft and that uh, no one's ever done that and uh, so it was a perfect holy grail kind of experiment where we where the aerodynamicist wanted to really see what was going on and wouldn't compromise um so uh, we uh did all of our work designed analyzed and built this titanium suction panel sent it down to California to Dryden uh, facility at Edwards Air Force Base, and they put it on the airplane, and they didn't really want to talk to us that much in two years, you know. They just wanted to do their own thing. I had NASA. Uh, Langley was in charge of the whole thing. NASA Dryden was flying the airplane and putting it together, and and they kind of quit talking to us. And... Uh, came time for the flight test, and I went down there, and we identified a bunch of pressures underneath the panel and in different places where we would be concerned structurally that um, you want the wing of the airplane to be doing the lifting. We didn't want the experiment on top of the wing to be lifting the airplane. And so we had a low-pressure vent 
back here in the back on the interface control drawing that said as long as we have this low pressure vent back here the pressure will be low underneath between the panel and the wing and so the wing will be doing the lifting not the experiment and so we got uh they we identified uh 30 or 40 different pressures and we had strain gauges on things and if they reached a certain level we'd turn our yellow light on on our control panel this is like a a space flight you know there's 30 terminals in a room and you, everybody's looking at their terminal and monitoring what's going on and the aerodynamicists there's a whole bunch of them and systems people and the two of us structures guys a nasa guy and me <coughs> and we identified the pressures that we thought you know what we designed the panel to what we designed the interface structure to and what would uh what would turn on a red light and what would turn on a yellow light you know and uh they took off and everything went great until they did a high angle of attack. And all of a sudden we had this yellow light come on. And all these high powered world famous aerodynamics people looked over at these two structures guy. What are what are you doing having a a structures problem? This is an air you know, and and so then they cut the flight short and they said, Well, we can't land this airplane without going to a high angle of attack. And, and, you know, they said, what, how serious is this? And, well, offhand, it's just, you know, we said if the, this pressure was a certain difference, then it was above what we designed the, the, the system that holds this on the airplane to. But we have a lot of margin. You know, we did, a instead of a one and a half factor of safety, we had 2.33. We doubled the, the margin on it. So we said, you're going to have to land this plane, right? And uh, it's likely that nothing's going to happen because we had a lot of, it's not a structures experiment. And so we design, we over-designed it. Uh, and, uh, and so they landed safely and then they, we all got in a room and, and uh, they were talking about it. And, and, you know, just everyone is glaring at these, this structures guy. And, and I said, well, I don't understand how the pressure got that high. The uh, low pressure vent shouldn't have let that happen. And the head of the program said, what low pressure vent? And I said, the low pressure vent on the interface control drawing. And I got out the drawing and I said, this low pressure vent. And they had forgotten to put the low pressure vent in a fairing back here to keep that pressure from getting too high. And the meeting ended abruptly and uh, a week later they flew it and it was fine. But uh, the lesson I learned is you got to just ask dumb questions. You got to be annoying to people. Don't assume that other people do their jobs. And the worst that can happen is they think you're a pest. Uh, the best thing that could happen is you save somebody's life. And so um, here I, I said the difference between a big and a small, but this is a beautiful program because you, with only. You know, this is a $45 million NASA program with uh, 45 key people working on it. And you have a lot of responsibility on a small program. Whereas if I worked on that 777, I'd be responsible for five wing ribs, you know, and that would be it. Uh, you can get really compartmentalized on a big program. And <clears throat> you can have a lot of responsibility and a lot of variety and interesting things on a small program. Lottery. So anyway, so a little more about uh, laminar flow control, which I worked on. We did a, somebody proposed laminar flow control for the leading edges of the 787. And so we worked on that for a couple of years and I did all the structures work, all of the element level testing, thousands of really interesting analysis and uh, uh, testing uh, little projects that we had. So the way laminar flow works, this is a conventional airfoil and and the, the flow starts out really smooth or laminar, and then it starts to tumble, and that's turbulent flow. That just makes the wing look thicker to the oncoming, uh, oncoming air. And so if you can suck the, if you can put little holes in your structure and suck the boundary layer off, then the flow is laminar a lot further, and so the drag's a lot less. So they wanted to put it on the 787-9. Uh, this would be the uh, titanium the reason you ha it's not it's titanium and it's not any other material is you can drill really tiny holes with a laser beam in in uh, titanium i can 
I can't, I'm not supposed to tell you how tiny those holes are, but they are really tiny. They're so tiny. You have to hold a, if, if you have a piece of titanium and the holes are drilled in it, it doesn't, you can't see it until you put a light behind it. <clears throat> so they're really small holes. But <coughs> the, uh, one thing that happened is when you put a new, a brand new structure on a plane, you have to do a physical bird test on a leading edge because the requirement is uh, when the plane hits a bird, it can't go past the front spar. You can't, you can lose your, your leading edge, but you can't lose your front spar. So the airplane can go back and land. And when you have a lot of, most of this is done, you do thousands of an, very complex analytical models, uh, finite element models with, we were using a program called LS Dyna, which is a dynamic finite element model program, which has the ability to change element, change the shape of the elements in steps. And it, it uh, has nonlinear properties, which means when there's a fastened step, the, the properties of that joint are a certain stiffness up until a certain amount of strain, and then a different stiffness. And so it's, it's a very complex program. It takes a Cray computer running overnight to do one analysis. And so it's, it's a very complex analysis. And this is my story about, uh, about the management side of that. As we were doing, uh, this was done by a group in Philadelphia. Uh, although the same, the, the same group in Seattle could have done it, but they, they had this farmed this out to Philadelphia. Uh, my group could have done it, the analysis work. And so we're going along and we're developing this and they're, what we want to know is we put a titanium strap in the front end of this thing and we put it there kind of as a placeholder because we didn't know how much effect it had in stopping the bird. And so we kind of went on like that and, and these they had these simulations, which is a video cartoon of, of the bird, a simulated bird coming through the leaning edge. And I just got this off the internet. This isn't really correct at all. But this is a, a genuine bird strike uh, photo uh, looks like on a wing, <coughs> not a leaning edge of the tail. But uh, so it's a very complex analysis and the elements uh, change shape and properties as you go along and step through this analysis. And uh, and something just didn't look right about how this strap was coming off in the front to me. It's just like I've done been around enough dynamic testing and dynamic analysis to see, um, I don't, that just doesn't look right. And I said, can we have a, a half day review by the Seattle uh, dynamics analysis people and just see what they think of this because it's something that looks funny to me. And, uh, and I'll never, I'll never forget the uh, manager at 787. He'd been trained to do this. He told me directly, he said, if you ha give, no, we cannot have a technical analysis, uh, a technical review of this complex analysis. Um, when you put, if you give two engineers the same job, you'll come up with two different answers and your schedule and budget are blown. And he, he forbade me to have a technical review of this bird strike analysis. And that just didn't set well with me at all. And so at the next scheduled uh, teleconference between Philadelphia and Seattle, everybody gets on, on a, a WebEx uh, or a Zoom meeting kind of thing. And uh, I said... I've invited uh, I've invited a dynamics guy from Seattle to review this. Can you go through it again? And uh, the manager wasn't on the 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 telephone call. And uh, they got about halfway through it, and he said, "Hey, did you guys hear that Lawrence Livermore changed that code about two years ago? And they had made a, a huge mistake in their material card. And there was silence on the phone. And uh, he said, no, we didn't hear that. He said, yeah. And he, and he went into some technical jargon about there's, this little, there's one line of code in that where they made a mistake. And they immediately knew what he was talking about. And they went and they said, well, okay, we'll check it out and we'll uh, change the code and let you know. So then he went away. They changed the code. Overnight, they ran the analysis again came back the next day and the analysis was completely different and it looked like more like I thought it would look. And it, what it said was we didn't have to have a titanium strap in the front end of our leading edge. We could go with something much cheaper like a chopped fiber composite because 
because it was the bond line that was failing, not the not the the, the strap in on the inside of the sandwich of this uh, leading edge. And so <laughs> I said, well, we can save millions of dollars because we don't have to do a super plastic form titanium leading edge strap, you know. And and uh, and it turns out that they'd already bought the tooling for this high temperature titanium super plastic forming. And once you spend three million dollars in tooling. They don't want to hear that you didn't need that part, and so they 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 refuse to change. But it it but the whole idea that you would not want a technical review because it will blow your budget. I mean, we don't want people arguing. We don't want people second guessing. We don't want people with different opinions. Uh, you're doomed to failure if your company goes down that path. So the lesson is: have lots of technical reviews. Invite non advocates. Uh, people you know who who don't like what you're doing, who think it can be done better. <clears throat> Invite them, argue it out, and if you can't come to a resolution between what you know and what they know, then say, what plan could we have? How short can we do this? What analysis, what searching can we do? What testing can we quickly get together and do that will convince all of us in this room that this is okay? And... Uh, on the other hand, you know, once you get that to a certain point where, and you, there are people, there are plenty of engineers around who will say something that's controversial or something that they don't think it'll work. And you got to just, you, if you listen long enough to say, okay, this guy, that's interesting, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to, we're not going to go that way. We've, we reviewed it and we're not going to go that way. Then then fine, you can go that way and you can save whatever cost and schedule you can. But uh, you have to come to a certain level and a bunch of people have to come to a certain level of confidence that uh, you've got it right. Uh, this ties into a lot of Boeing problems and I, I put this chart in here. Uh, <clears throat> the biggest Boeing problem currently in 2022 is that <clears throat> somebody... Uh, the 737 MAX had to be more fuel efficient, so they they put bigger engines on it, and they had to move the engines forward in, in order to accommodate that. That meant that when the engines are on, there's more of a, a upturning moment. And to compensate for that, they said, well, we don't want, you know, when the, the airplanes put gas to the engines, there's the plane goes tilts up more than we wanted to. And so they put this complicated system called Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentations in MCAS. And when the angle of attack gets to a certain level, the, the a computer takes over control of the airplane, turns the horizontal tail so that the nose will go down. And the pilots, um, it's kind of a surprise to them if they haven't been trained. The other problem there's always a series of problems when there's a big disaster, was that the uh, the 737 MAX was sold to the airlines based on no new training for the pilots. And so the pilots that fly this don't know about MCAS. Some of them learned about it, and uh, some of the older pilots knew about it. And one of the other problems is that uh, new pilots sometimes just act like they're in a simulator and they don't look out the window. And, and and figure out what's going on. Well, they didn't know about the MCAS. And so both the Indonesia Airlines and the Egyptian Airlines 737s that crashed, 300 more, you know, people died. It's the same problem, which is unforgivable for Boeing to have this. Turns out the angle of attack sensor, which is just kind of like a weather vane sticking out the nose, there are two of them, one on the left, one on the right. And they were only using data from one of them to say what the angle of attack was of the airplane. Now, that goes against everything Boeing's ever learned. You always have, if something's critical, you you have two of them. You have two control wires. If one breaks, you still have one. Even the the throttle on the old Boeing airplanes was made in, by in two castings, in case one casting had a flaw in it. Everything is duplicated, double redundancy. Uh, it's the baseline of safety. And for some reason, they only used one of these angle of attack sensors. Now, these can get hit by birds or they can ice up and 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 be not working. And that's what happened on these these airplanes is they, they somehow, the angle of attack sensor, the only one they were using, didn't work. Now, if they'd had 
two and compared the results, then you could have a computer say, hey, one must be wrong and uh, go, you know, average them or go with the other one or, or warn the pilots that one of them wasn't working. But so what happened was the angle of attack sensor w was malfunctioning and telling the airplane that uh, it was in a nose up position. And so this MCAS system kicked in and turned the nose down. And so these poor pilots, the airplane's trying to keep nose down and they're pulling it back and then it tries to nose down and they do this roller coaster in the air for a long time and finally in the case of uh, Indonesia and Egyptian airlines the, the plane crashed because of this and that's why the 737 MAX has been grounded for two or three I don't know a long time now and they can't deliver any and and the FAA didn't catch this and <coughs> they're they're at fault too because they nobody and but it goes back to the basic root problem not enough technical review not enough critics in the room telling you know this was a, a problem that lots of people knew about but there were not reviews enough to to make this a safe airplane and that's the sad thing about it. you can learn a lot more about this but uh, it goes back to the same problem we don't want to have technical reviews. We want to save money and time. And I understand at some point you have to sell airplanes at a profit if you want to be a profitable company. But it's gone too far that way, in my opinion. And they need to get back, get back to good technical um, reasoning. Uh, I'm nearly done here. Uh, there's a book uh, by John Kay called Obliquity, Why Our Goals Are Best Achieved Indirectly. Uh, and in the case of Boeing, Boeing was started and run by engineers for many, many years. Uh, William Boeing said, We have already proved that science and hard work can lick what appears to be insurmountable difficulties. There was lots of arguing allowed, there lots of te technical disagreement. And uh, profit was in your peripheral vision. It's, uh, if you con in other words, if you concentrate on just making the best product you can, be it an electric car, electric bicycle, airplanes, cars, anything you do as an engineer. If you just, con this principle says that if, if you just concentrate on doing the best you can and making the best product, profits will come. You don't have to worry too much about profits. But the way companies evolve, and it happened at GE and it happened at Boeing, is that there's this mentality that, uh, you know, the engineers need to be put in the back seat sometimes and the guy trying to make money needs to needs to drive this car. And I see the I see that has to happen sometimes. Sometimes they have it. There's an old saying at Boeing, there comes a time in a program when you have to shoot the engineers and build the airplane. And I understand that. Engineers, if you let them go, they will first solve the the 30% problem, then the 10% problem, then the 5% problem, 3%, and finally they're working and trying to delay your program so they can make it 1% lighter or even less than that. And there's a certain point where you've done enough, at, you've reached a certain level where you say, you know what, this is good enough to go to production. We have to, we can't keep doing this. We can't do keep doing research and development. We have to sell product. <coughs> and so uh, I understand there's another side to this story. Uh, but the the balance has, has shifted toward profits instead of good engineering in in certain certain cases. Uh, most cases not. There's still great engineers. There's still great managers. And Boeing Company is a great company, and they will survive, and they will do better. But they had a lesson to learn here um, in the 2010s, 2020s. Um, in 1997, Boeing acquired McDonnell Douglas, and but the McDonnell Douglas management system came, and they made Harry Stonecipher, a former uh, Jack Welch GE guy, and and uh, leader of McDonnell Douglas made him the CEO of Boeing. And incredibly, this is quoted, uh, they asked him uh, what he thought about his career in the Boeing CEO, Harry Stonecipher, incredibly said this. When people say, people say, I changed the culture of Boeing, that was the intent. 
so that it's run like a business rather than a great engineering firm. That's a direct quote from the CEO of Boeing. And whatever engineering career you have, <clears throat> you'll find it starts out with just people who just want to do the engineering and do it, do, do it really great. Or shoot, if you were a baking company and you wanted to bake the best cake in the world, you'd have people who, who could do it the best. And at some point in time, uh, people who just want to make profit come in and they, they usurp that authority. And they want to be in charge. And, you know, we, we invest and we want, we want to see uh, our investments increase. And we want them to make money. But uh, there's a price to be paid if they put profit in front of quality. Um, I was part, in 2014, one of the reasons they left Boeing is they were cutting the research and development uh, people. And really, you know, thinking, let's see, we'll solve a short-term profit problem by by causing a 20 year long uh, technical problem and that just that's the signal of the beginning of the end for a company anyway that's my thoughts i'm paul gregg i build backyard roller coasters and i had a really fun career at boeing structures technology uh, and uh, that's my presentation thank you very much